Okay, I, I think we'll make a start. Um, thanks for joining the irrigation webinar series. Um, and welcome to the Goulburn Intervalley Trade and Murray Shortfall Risks webinar. My name's Rob O'Connor. I work at Echuca in irrigation with Ag Vic. I need to let you know that you have been muted and this webinar will be recorded and it will be distributed to webinar participants once it's been through our approval process. If you happen to have any technical issues through the course of the webinar, please contact Sandra Beasley using one of the contacts listed there on the screen. Um, if you use Zoom chat, please select host to contact Sandra or her email or phone address there. Sandra works as a, an irrigation extension officer based at Kerrang. If we could flick to the next slide, please, Alex. Thank you. Um, we do encourage people to ask questions through the through the webinar. Um, please use the chat function to do that and select co-host. The question will go through to me and I'll put it to the presenters. Uh, after the, the second speaker, we plan to have a, a question break um, all going to time and also at the end of the webinar. The questions will be prioritised depending on how relevant the question is to the topic. And there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar. So if you could complete that, that would be a big help. Thank you. And we're aiming to finish at, at two o'clock. Just a shout out to our supporters, to the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, the CMAs along the Murray River, the Rural Water Authorities, Regional Development, Development Victoria and Agriculture Victoria. We have three speakers today. They're from the from the retail water entitlements and markets uh, section in in DELP. Our first speaker is Sarah Ryan. Sarah is going to give us an overview of the Goulburn to Murray Intervalley Trade. Alex Murray will talk after Sarah and Alex will talk about Goulburn Intervalley Trade opportunities and some of those underlying principles. And then to top it off at the end, Penny Clark will talk about Murray system shortfall risks. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Sarah. Thanks, Rob. And um, thanks, everyone, for coming along today pre-Christmas. Appreciate you making the time. Uh, before I kick off, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. We're all meeting on different country. Alex and I are sharing a room on Wurundjeri land. It's nice to be back in the office. It's nice to see real people. We are starting to get out and about and talking a bit more about the Golden Tamari Trade Review at the moment, and we'll try to get through as much as we can today. So I won't spend too much time giving you a bit of an overview of the project, but we are always around for further questions as well and happy to come out and chat to people one-on-one -on -one too, if that's useful. So what we are covering today, a bit, as I said, of an overview of the Golden Tamari Trade Review project and the interim rules that we're testing this year. So I'll take you guys through that. Alex will run us through uh, more about how trade actually works uh, out of the Goulburn, what those opportunities are looking like, and what the interim rules actually mean for trade this year. So uh, we'll give you some uh, useful links to take away as well if you aren't aware of already where to find this information. So hopefully that will be helpful too. And then we'll hand over to Penny to talk about shortfall risks this year uh, in the Murray. So a bit different this year, it's quite wet, but that doesn't mean we aren't still facing some challenges in river operations. So it's useful to be aware of what the conditions are and what they might mean for you. So uh, most of you may have seen, we did have an announcement by the Acting Minister for Water, Richard Wynne, back in June, that this year we're going to trial interim trade and operating rules for the Lower Goulburn. That's an exciting win for us. There's been a fair bit that's gone into that, which I'll run through in a second, but it is off the back of uh, doing a fair bit of consultation on 
a regulatory impact statement really looking at what trade and operating rules should be from the Goulburn to the Murray with the overall objective of um, enabling trade but within the ecological tolerances of the river and without impacting anybody else as well. So some of that announcement included uh, some interim operating rules, which I'll go through a little bit, but won't touch too much on today because we've spoken a fair bit about that in the past. Uh, actually kicking off some monitoring, which is exciting. So over the next three years, we'll be looking at how the river is responding to these rules that we're putting in place and building up the monitoring that's been done to date to help us get to where we are on those interim rules. We've also managed to make tagging restrictions that have been in place uh, under interim regulations since 2019, actually made permanent now. And that's really important. They uh, came into effect before the interim ones expired on the 30th of November. That's something we heard loud and clear through regulatory impact statement consultation that people were keen to see happen. And that's really um, so that we don't see a situation that we had previously, which is that people moving water through tagged accounts could actually uh, get around the trade limits when trade was closed. And that just meant that we ended up with a situation where there was more water owed from the Goulburn to the Murray than we could actually deliver. So closing that loophole was really important. The minister did announce that there's more work for us to do on the Lowell Broken Creek, which again, I won't get into too much today. Um, we can send some additional information on where that's up to, but we do need to look at what tagging rules should be within the creek itself. And that's again, so that the creek doesn't become its own little loophole around trading limits and that we're managing risks for into the future as well. So a bit more work to do there. And then the interim trade rule, which Alex will run through in a fair bit of detail today. There's good conditions for us to bring this in. It does mean that we're in a situation this year for the first time in a long time. That means that trade opportunity is actually matched to what we can deliver within those ecological tolerances of the river. So that's a really exciting thing for us to have been able to put in place since 1 July this year. There is a fair bit that we're testing this year in all of this. I'll run through that a little bit but all of that will help to underpin a government decision by, the, by 1 July 2022 on what those longer term operating rules and trade rule will actually be as well. So as I said, how did we get here? There's been a fair bit that's gone into this review so far, way back in 2019. Uh, we really started to put in place some of those interim operating rules to try and keep flows in the Lower Goulburn River lower over summer and autumn when the river would naturally be lower. And that was really to prevent damage that we had been seeing happen to the Lower Goulburn River from sustained high flows over that summer and autumn period. So it's been a bit of a road getting here. The most recent thing that you might be familiar with is the regulatory impact statement. As mentioned, we did go out and test what our preferred option would be for both operating rules and trade rules um, through that consultation period back in, I think it was about March, April, bit of a blur through COVID, but there was a period there where we could come out and talk to people. Out of that, we heard some really strong mixed views about um, particularly the operating rules, which really are there to set those uh, limits on how much water should be delivered over summer and autumn. So concerns that it wouldn't enable enough trade to be delivered or that it wouldn't enable um, the river to recover more over time. So that's really where a lot of what we're testing this year comes down to as well. Where we're up to now, which Alex will run through a bit, is uh, from 15th of December, we will see trade capped. And that's again, to make sure that we don't end up owing more water from the Goulburn than we can actually deliver to the Murray without exceeding those ecological tolerances. There's a bit more to it than that, but Alex will run you through it too. The other one that I mentioned is we do need to go back out and talk more to people in the Lower Broken Creek about tagging rules specific to that system. And all of these things that we're testing this year to do with trade and operating rules do need to be brought together so that it can underpin a government decision ahead of 1 July 2022. So we will be releasing a report around March, April, actually probably more like April if I'm honest, <laughs> that does bring together what we've learned so far this year and how it adds to the existing evidence base that we've gathered for the regulatory impact statement to date and through monitoring over recent years as well. I'll explain that a little bit more too. So what I really would like to go through today, again, there's a whole bunch of things that we could go through, but focusing in uh, today on the operating rules, the operating plan and the trade rule, just a bit of an overview of what we're talking about there. 
the operating rules are those flow limits over the summer and autumn period. So really recognising that there are different ecological tolerances over that period and we should be delivering within that too so that we can avoid damage to the lower goal bin. The ones that we're trialling this year do build on the last two years that we've had interim operating rules. So the last couple of years, we were aiming for monthly flow limits to keep it lower than it had been in previous years. What we're doing this year is actually looking for more of a prescribed variability. And that again is to be more in line with what you'd see happen in the river uh, over that summer and autumn period. So it is a working river, but getting more of that natural variability built into the way that we're delivering that water over summer and autumn. That includes things like prescribed periods of low flows at 1100 megalitres per day and making use of pulses to be able to deliver that water that supports trade as well. That's actually built into an operating plan, which Penny and Alex will talk to a bit more as well which sets a default delivery pattern so that we can see year round how river operators are actually going to deliver that water out of Goulburn. So it takes a bit of a mystery away from where we have been previously, a bit of a will they, won't they call water out. This is assuming under average conditions that this water would be called out in a specific pattern. And it does mean that we're still abiding by those flow limits over summer and autumn as well. We've also got the interim trade rule, which again, Alex will run us through a bit more. But importantly, that trade rule is matched to what we can deliver under the operating rules and the operating plan. So that we do have a new trade limit in place. That means that we're not going to end up in a situation where we owe water, more water for delivery from the Goulburn to the Murray than we can make good on. So in terms of what that trade rule actually supports, again, this is a bit of an overview. Alex will take us through how we got here and how it actually functions. But what we'd expect in an average year under the interim trade rule is about 130 gig of trade opportunity, and that's net trade. So this isn't an average year, and we'll explain what that means, but this is just useful to put into context a bit around how that compares to previous years of actual net trade. And as you can see, it's quite difficult to pick an average year. We do see years like last year where you end up with net trade back up into the Goulburn. But importantly, uh, out of this, you can see it is lower than those 2017, 18 and 18, 19 years in terms of expected trade opportunity. And those were the years that we saw environmental damage occurring to the Goulburn. It was extreme drought in New South Wales. So we saw really high demand for trade opportunity out of the Goulburn. But the consequence of that was we did see damage to the river system itself. So it's important to actually recognise that there are limits limits on how much water can be delivered out of the Goulburn. So what we're hoping to learn this year is reviewing the trade rule and how that's working together with the operating plan to make sure that trade is actually optimised uh, and that those triggers that Penny will run us through a bit and Alex as well in the operating plan give us the flexibility that we need to be able to respond to seasonal conditions without unnecessarily restricting trade. The other big bit of work that we're doing this year, which will again come together in the synthesis report for April and help support a government decision, is learning more about the operating rules, which are really those flows over summer and autumn. So testing what the ecological tolerances are of the river, particularly around use of pulses. There's a number of bits of work that are going into that. And that's really uh, to give us further understanding of what the ecological tolerances are with additional scientific panel assessment helping underpin that. Learning from recent years of monitoring, again, we're not starting from scratch here, but actually building that into our updated assessment. Understanding what the opportunities will be for recreational uh, users of the river as well. We had years of sustained high flows. So what does it look like if we have periods of low flows with pulses as well? We're working with traditional owners who are undertaking monitoring from a cultural perspective as well. So that'll be really useful insight for us. And then also river operations, whether or not we can actually pursue some of these pulses that are currently, um, we've, we've previously said, we'll try and operate the river at about 3000 megalitres per day to uh, prevent any impacts to pumps that sit within the river channel but really working with GMW to see if there's anything we can do to mitigate any potential impacts to uh, pump owners, but still pursue some of those pulses in the meantime. So that's ongoing work that we're doing with GMW. We are also hoping to find some more information out about how many people might be impacted by pulses and whether or not um, there are mitigation options for them there. For example, 
what would they do currently if there was a flood? So that's really useful information for us when we're looking at long-term operating rules. As I said, all of this will come together. This is a bit of a complex diagram, but really what it's trying to say is we're using the information we gather this year to build on our existing evidence base that we used for the regulatory impact statement. So we will still need to recommend out of this work this year, which option best balances the objectives of the review. This will help us um, inform the government decision, but it really is still comparing to the base case of what would happen if there was no regulatory change, which option is most likely to prevent environmental damage, but also uh, enable trade for the long term, which we know people rely on, and make sure that we're not creating situations like increasing delivery risks in the Murray that we can't manage. So they're the objectives that we're balancing, and ultimately whatever we learn this year, we'll be adding to the existing evidence base we have to help inform this long term decision. So I might hand over to Alex now, I'm sure there'll be lots of um, questions. But we'll see how many of them Alex answer before we head over to question time as well. Yes. Um, so as Sarah said, um, this today we really wanted to focus on um, the trade rule and trade opportunity and really what that means for um, people managing their water and accessing trade. So what the interim rule means for you know how people manage their water. Um, so I just wanted to start off by doing a quick overview of what the interim trade rule is. Um, I know many of you have probably seen it before, but, um, you know, it does help to, to see it over and over again um, is to, to work out how it works. So to start off, I wanted to just cover what the interim trade is, rule is for this year. And then um, I'll go a little bit more into how um, and when trade opportunity is available um, and when to find out where to find out about that trade opportunity as well. <clears throat> so as um, Sarah mentioned, um, the interim trade rule in an average year um, supports about 130 gigalitres of, of trade opportunity. So um, obviously, you know, no year is really average, but that's kind of what we expect um, if we have yet a very average year. Um, in a drier year, um, there will be a little bit more trade supported and in a wetter year, a little bit less um, trade supported. Um, so... I'm going to break it down into the, the different times, periods of the, um, of the year and uh, what that means for trade opportunity and, and how that works. Um, so the first thing we do at the 1st of July is um, we quarantine some legacy commitments. Um, and legacy commitments are water that need to be delivered every year from the Murray to the Goulburn. Um, so there's about, sorry, from the Goulburn to the Murray. <laughs> Sarah just looked at me like I got that terribly wrong um, from the Goldman to the Murray. So every year these commitments need to be delivered. The first thing is 40 gigalitres of, um, of snowy uh, water. So that water is, is essentially um, means that water can be kept in the snowy for um, to sustain flows in the snowy and it's delivered instead from the Goulburn. So that is something that happens every year and, and has always happened every year. So um, first thing happens is 40 gigalitres get set aside for, for that water. Um, the next thing is we have about 100 gigalitres of, um, of water that underpins Murray entitlements. And so that's a historic commitment when um, trade, permanent trade used to be allowed, you essentially could change a Goulburn um, water entitlement and make it a Murray water entitlement. So there's about 100 gigalitres um, of that kind of trade that obviously doesn't happen anymore, but still needs to be delivered because it underpins those entitlements. So that water is subject to seasonal determination. Um, what used to happen is we used to add it to that balance um, every time the seasonal determination um, went up. Um, now under the old trade rule, we set that aside at the start of the year as assuming that seasonal determinations are going to get to 100%. The reason that is, is because if you keep doing it throughout the year, um, it often makes the trade opportunity go negative and, and we have to wait longer for that trade, um, trade to open. Um, so with um, our new limit on how much water we're allowing to be owed from the Goulburn to the Murray um, of 190 gigalitres, that leaves us at about 50 gigalitres 
sense of opening trade opportunity. So the way that the trade rule is written now, we expect that opening trade opportunity to be about 50 gigalitres each year. Obviously, there will be some conditions that mean that that can vary, but under normal conditions, we expect that trade opportunity to be there, which is a little bit different to how things used to work um, when the balance could roll over from the previous year and there may not be any opportunity available at the 1st of July. Um, the next thing that happens is through winter and spring, we have what's called a rolling limit. So whenever that, um, that amount of water owed from the, Murray, from the Goulburn to the Murray drops below 190 gigalitre, trade opens. Um, so that's from the 1st of July to the 15th of December. So that effectively works like the old trade rule used to work. So whenever that um, balance drops down, um, trade is open up to that balance again. Um, under the um, interim trade rules and in an average year, we expect that to produce um, to create about 80 gigalitres of trade opportunity. So from the 15th of December, so this is quite different to how the old trade rule um, worked, um, net trade is capped. So essentially on the 15th of December, we announce what, um, what's called the summer and autumn trade cap. Um, what that trade cap is, is any water that we previously quarantined and we can actually, we know we're not going to get to 100% of seasonal determinations. We can release a little bit of that water as trade opportunity. So that's the first thing. And then any obviously trade opportunity that's still available under that 190 gigalitre limit. Once we're back at that 190 gigalitre limit, so that's the amount of water owed from the Goulburn to the Murray, um, net trade is capped. The reason that is, is because we're really trying to draw down that volume owed down to zero for the end of the season to therefore support that opening trade opportunity again at the 1st of July. Um, so in an average year, like, like this year where you're seeing 100% um, of seasonal determinations already reached, um, that summer and autumn cap means that we won't be releasing anything from, from those quarantined legacy commitments. Um, so there'll be no additional trade opportunity from those legacy commitments created at the 15th of December. So all together, together that gives us our 130 gigalitres of um, trade opportunity under average conditions. And I'll go a little bit more into why that varies and how that varies um, as we go and, and how therefore you can um, have a little bit less trade opportunity, a little bit more trade opportunity um, in drier or wetter years. Um, so this is just a little bit of a comparison um, of the um, old trade rule versus the interim trade rule that we have at the moment. So you can see there, there are there's a, a number of actions um, or time points, we've called them actions here, but um, or time points where trade opportunity is available. So the first one is that 1st of July opening trade opportunity. Under the old trade rule, um, it, you actually weren't guaranteed any trade opportunity at the 1st of July. So what would happen is the IVT balance from the previous year would roll over. Um, those legacy commitments would also go into the IVT balance. And if you were already at 200 gigalitres, um, trade would not open. And so we saw that um, last year, I think, when trade didn't open till about February, because we were already over that 200 gigalitre limit. So under the interim rule, you're looking at typically in, a, in an average year, you're looking at about 50 gigalitres of trade opportunity expected at, at the 1st of July. Um, so that's a little bit different to obviously what, what we used to see under the old trade rule. The next thing is um, water that is physically delivered or could be physically delivered um, from the Goulburn to the Murray from the 1st of July to the 15th of December will create trade opportunity. So just like the old um, trade rule, when you deliver water, um, your obviously amount owed from the Goulburn to the Murray drops down. Um, and when that drops under 190 gigalitres, um, it creates a little bit of trade opportunity up to that limit again. The second thing there that says Goulburn IVT that could be delivered, but won't be due to spill risk. We call this um, deferred water, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about what that, um, that kind of um, deferral means. But essentially, under the old trade rule, if you, um, you know, didn't deliver water, no trade opportunity was created. Um, in the case of deferred tra uh, trade, sorry, deferred delivery under the new trade rule, um, we 
uh, you can still create trade opportunity just as if that water was delivered. And again, we'll go a little bit more into what um, those deferrals are, but essentially this is just showing that whenever that um, amount of water that's owed from the Goulburn to the Murray in that year drops below 190 gigalitres, you'll have trade open, but only till the 15th of December. So from the 15th of December, we obviously have that summer and autumn trade cap in place. So this is quite different to how the old trade rule worked, um, where there was no difference to trade opportunity um, throughout the year or the way that trade was created throughout the year. So now at um, the 15th of December, your net trade is capped. So after that summer and autumn trade cap is taken up, that opportunity is taken up, no more trade is created from those um, deliveries of IBT. The exception to that is obviously back trade. So because it's a cap on net trade, back trade from the Murray back in, up into the Goulburn will still create trade opportunity just as it used to. So I'll go a little bit deeper into what the trade, um, what that means for back trade, um, because the back trade rule for the Goulburn has in fact not changed, um, but the way um, the forward trade rule does affect um, when back trade is available. So we'll go a little bit more into that in a second. Um, so again, I'm just going to uh, step through this, those um, four actions, if you will, or four time points when trade opportunity is available, um, just so that it, it's very clear about how that's working. So the first one is opening trade opportunity on the 1st of July. Um, so you can see here that this is just a good um, bar graph of that 190 gigalitre limit. So that's the limit um, on water owed from the Goulburn to the Murray. So under the old trade rule, that was 200 gigalitres. It has come down a little bit. And the reason that is, is because we know we can deliver that 190 gigalitres after the 15th of December, bringing that, IV, that balance back down to zero and creating trade opportunity again at the 1st of July the following year. So you can see there that the um, 40 gigalitres at the bottom there, we've got um, to restore those flows in the Snowy River. So that's your 40 gigalitres um, in, the, in the balance there. You've got that 100 gigalitres of quarantined exchange rate trade. So that is those legacy commitments that underpin some entitlements in the Murray um, and they are subject to seasonal um, determination. So that is the, the bit of water that we, we say it's quarantined because whether or not the seasonal determinations get up to 100% is actually what um, dictates whether we need to keep that water quarantined in the, in the balance there. Um, and then you can see there that that gives you the 50 gigalitres of opening trade opportunity that's expected um, in, on the 1st of July. So the next um, action, um, if you will, is the winter and spring trade opportunity. So that's the, 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 tr um, the trade that becomes open and available from the 1st of July to the 15th of December. Um, so as we've said, trade is available whenever the water owed to the Murray is less than 190 gigalitres. Um, but the actual new trade opportunity um, volumes will vary with seasonal conditions. So obviously, if it's a wetter year, um, we may not be delivering as much from the Goulburn to the Murray. There may not be as much demand also, which will, will change trade opportunity. But if on the flip side, if it's a dry year, you're obviously going to have more demand downstream. You might be delivering more, which does mean some more trade opportunity is created. Um, we'll go a little bit more into what those seasonal conditions are. Um, mean and, and when things are varied. So each month, um, GMW update their website and they show how seasonal conditions um, have varied the deliveries for that um, for that month. So essentially, we have some default. We have a default delivery pattern written into an operating plan for the Goulburn IVT, which is what we expect to deliver each month in an average year. And then we obviously have variations um, that will change that volume from the expected default. So the variations may be that the volume is reduced, and that's um, more often than not in a in a wetter year like we have um, this year. Um, where if volumes are increased, which again is more likely in a drier year, or if the timing of those deliveries are a little bit varied. And that's particularly around those months with those pulses that Sarah mentioned. Um, so just like under the old trade rule, um, weekly opportunity from the 1st of July to the 15th of December is updated in the Victorian Water Register each Wednesday at 10am. 
Um, so that's unchanged from the how we used to do things with the exception that that is only up until the 15th of December. So as I said, we do have an operating plan um, for the um, for the Goulburn, deliveries of Goulburn IVT. Um, I won't go too deeply into what the operating plan means and all the details, but that can be accessed um, and we'll, we'll show you where you can um, find the operating plan and some more information about that operating plan. But essentially, the operating plan does set out the default delivery pattern for the whole year. So not just that summer and autumn period where we're talking about the um, how the flows should vary on the Goulburn, but it sets out those monthly um, deliveries um, for that whole year. And it's really about how we're managing that amount of water that's um, owed from the Goulburn to the Murray. Again, this is um, in an average year. So you can see there in the dark blue, they're our expected or default delivery pattern um, up until the 15th of December. And you can see there that December is, um, is split into two. You've got dark blue and you've got the light blue. So the light blue is where um, the trade is no longer created from those, um, from those deliveries. So that's where we're running um, down that amount of owed water down to zero for the end of the season. Um, so you can see there that the default delivery pattern um, says that about 83 gigalitres will be delivered um, before the 15th of December. So that is that trade opportunity um, that is created from those default deliveries. Um, I might just um, throw over to Penny, um, who um, is a, a, a bit more of an expert on um, the, the conditions that vary these um, deliveries, and we'll also just quickly um, run through what's happened so far this year too. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So this table we've got showing here, this just presents the reasons that the delivery may vary from the default pattern that Alex just showed. Um, and the reason we've got these, these triggers is they're all designed to make sure that we don't allow trade opportunity that can't be delivered within the operating plan and, or, and, and won't increase delivery risks in the Murray. They're also designed to make sure we don't unnecessarily restrict trade as well. Uh, so the first three triggers here, um, sorry, as well as uh, this table, as well as presenting how the delivery will be varied, it also presents how the trade opportunity will be impacted by that variation. So the first three triggers here all relate to a reduction in the trade opportunity during this winter spring period. So the first one is if there's partial uptake of trade. When that happens, we need to reduce the deliveries because if we deliver too much water now in winter and spring, there may not be enough water to meet demands over that peak summer period. The second one is um, if there are high flows in the Goulburn or the Murray Rivers um, that would prevent the delivery of IVT water. So the triggers there are based around certain flow rates that we wouldn't release water at because we have either high losses or flooding associated with their delivery. So in that case, the deliveries have to be reduced to zero and the trade opportunity is reduced accordingly. The third one is when water use in the Murray is less than average. Um, so we don't want to be delivering water if people aren't actually using in winter or spring, um, particularly if we can't harvest it downstream in a storage like Lake Victoria. So we reduce those deliveries and we need to reduce the um, trade opportunity as well to make sure we're not concentrating demands into a peak period that we can't actually supply. Um, and potentially increase delivery risks in the Murray as a result. Um, the fourth one is if that water use in spring is above average, we can actually increase the spring deliveries um, and correspondingly increase the trade opportunity. The fifth one around environmental outcomes allows some flexibility when environmental water holders want to manage, or environmental water managers identify an opportunity to, to manage some risks with delivering IOT in a certain way. They're quite specific, these ones. So for example, if there's a water quality event imminent, there may be an opportunity to release some more IVT earlier to support that. Um, similarly, a little bit more IVT can be released to um, slow the rate of recession following a high rainfall event. So the, the impact this has on trade opportunity is actually really just shifting the timing about when that might become available. 
And the last one in this list is a little bit different because um, this one doesn't actually affect trade opportunity at all. This is one we consider after we've considered all those, those first five um, variations. Um, and we can say, well, we, we could deliver this water. Um, we don't want to because there's a high risk of spill in Lake Victoria or unregulated flows downstream. So rather than delivering it, we defer the delivery for that water to be delivered at a time that suits. But because those demands have been met with high flows in the Murray, there's no reason for us to create trade up uh, to change uh, trade opportunity from the default. Um, and if you want to go to the next one, I'll run through what how this has played out this year, um, which you may have been watching along the way. Thanks, Alex. Yep. Uh, so this table here is just presenting the um, each of the months this year, well, from July to the 15th of December. Uh, the, def the second column there is showing you the 83 gigs of default delivery we have during this period. That's the same as the navy blue columns from Alex's graph earlier. And um, in the grey column, we can see what has actually um, what trade opportunity has actually been created in practice. So in September, there was a default uh, delivery volume of 14 gigs, uh, but the high flow trigger was met for all of four days during September. So we were only able to create two gigalitres of trade opportunity or a little bit under that. Similarly, in October, that high flow trigger was in play all month. Uh, so there was no trade opportunity created in October. In November, the flows fell below that trigger. Um, and we we're actually able to deliver more than the default delivery in November as a result of uh, above average Chirumbri water use in August and September. So that, that spring above average trigger had been met. Um, and then uh, for the first part of this set, from the 1st to the 15th of December, the 16 gigalitres is expected to be up to 11.5 gigalitres. Obviously this is still in play. Um, the high flow triggers haven't been met but um, there was below average water use in November in the Murray. And as a result, this has been proportionally reduced. So I think it was about 70% of average demand during November, resulting in a 70% reduction of 16 gigalitres. Um, and importantly, just my asterisk at the bottom of this slide here, just reminding you that while um, all that trade opportunity has been creative, none of it has actually been delivered so far because at that, the risk of spill in Lake Victoria has been high all season. Um, so we've been able to defer those deliveries, but not restrict trade opportunity. Thanks. Sorry, poor Alex is flicking between screens for us. Thanks for that, Penny. I think. Um, just while Alex is finding the unmute button, just my one of my key takeaways from that is we're showing you a, a fair bit about how the sausage is made when it comes to river operations here, but it is something we heard through consultation on the regulatory impact statement was important to people to take some of the mystery out of it when it comes to what actually drives these operational decisions and how that underpins trade opportunity as well. So that's, um, as Alex will show us at some point, is all publicly available. If you want to really get into it, we're happy to ask additional questions as well. But the next um, action or time point that we talk about when we're talking about trade is the summer and autumn trade cap. So from the, um, fifth, from the 15th of December, obviously we have the um, an cap on net trade. Um, so it is important to note that it is net trade. So we'll talk about back trade in a moment, but there will still be dribbles of trade opportunity after the trade cap is in place. Um, if there's trade um, back from the Murray back up into the Goulburn. So it is important to remember that. But the summer and autumn cap that is announced on the 15th of December at 10 a.m. is the sum of any trade still allowed under the 190 gigalitre IVT limit. So the 15th of December happens to be a Wednesday this year. 
Um, so in fact, trade will just open like it normally does when we pop in those either deferrals or delivered amounts of um, IVT as, as Penny ran through just before um, that create trade opportunities. So those go into the, um, into the water register at 10 a.m. on the 15th of December. Um, and then any trade that we can actually release from that legacy reserve. So this year we know that seasonal determinations are already at 100%. So we won't be releasing any trade from that legacy reserve this year. So that um, graph on the side there just shows you the difference between um, this year and then a slightly drier year and what could be released as trade opportunity on the 15th of December. So you can see there this year, we obviously have the 40 gigalitres um, that underpins those flows in the um, snowy. We have the 100 gigalitres of Murray that underpin Murray entitlements. And we know that they're already at 100% or seasonal determinations are. So we know we're going to need that whole 100 gigalitres. And then we've got that obviously other part of the, um, of the balance that opens and closes as trade opportunity. Um, you can see there on the other side, we've got an, an example of an 80% year. So this is the case where a year is a little bit drier and seasonal determinations are not going to get to 100%. So in this instance, seasonal determinations get to only 80%. Um, and you can see there in that kind of fuzzy um, pattern that you've got 20 gigalitres that therefore could be released as trade opportunity. So that could be released as part of that summer autumn cap in an 80% year. Once that summer and autumn cap is taken up, um, so on the 15th of December, once that trade opportunity is all taken up, um, deliveries and those deferrals no longer create trade opportunity. So, um, so there you go. Um, so once that's taken up, there is no longer that, um, that dipping under that 190 gigalitres that creates the trade opportunity. So the idea is that for the 30th of June, we're running down that volume owed right down to zero. So um, those deliveries and deferrals no longer mean that trade is open. Um, you can see there that the NVRM um, seasonal determinations um, link is there. So that is where the um, summer and autumn cap will be announced um, by the Northern Victoria Resource Manager on the 15th of December. But of course, also trade opportunity will just open on the, um, on the Victorian Water Register. And then the amount of trade opportunity that opens there will essentially be that, kind of, uh, that 15th of December cap. Um, and as I said, um, this is just a bit of a summary. The aim there is that the water owed to the Murray is being drawn down to zero by the 30th um, of June to support that opening trade opportunity for the following year. Um, so then I've mentioned this a few times, but it's just really important to note that the back trade rule has not changed. So there will still be trade opportunity even after the 15th of December created buy back trade. So that's when someone makes a trade from the Murray back into the Goulburn against the volume of water that's owed in the other direction. Um, so as I've said, there is no change to how that rule works. So that rule works just as it always did. You can essentially um, jump on the water register and I can show you in a moment and have a look at how much opportunity there is to move water from the Murray back up into the Goulburn. Um, and that is available all year. There's no cap on when back trade um, stops being available. And it will still create trade in the opposite direction even after the 15th of December. So that happens automatically in the water register whenever, whenever anyone makes a back trade, some trade will open the other direction. So that's not something that um, gets entered for 10 a.m. on a Wednesday. That's something that can just open up um, in dribs and drabs throughout the season. Before you go on, Al, can I just check maybe either Penny or Rob? Is there an unbearable echo happening while we're talking? So I might get out of my head. There, there is an echo, but it's it's okay. We can understand you. All right, Al. Cool. Okay. Push on. <laughs> um, sorry about that. I don't know what's going on over there. Um, so. This is just a little example. So the, the only difference with back trade is that obviously 
obviously as we draw down that volume O from the Goulburn to the Murray towards zero, there will be less back trade opportunity um, available at the end of the season. So, I mean, this could happen in, in any season. Um, so uh, last year, I know that we saw back trade opportunity decrease as it was being taken up at the end of the season. Um, but under the interim trade rule, if this is the rule that keeps on um, being the permanent trade rule, it does mean that there will be a definite drop down of that um, back trade opportunity towards the end of each season. So there's a couple of lines there. So back trade is available on any water owed from the Goulburn to the Murray. And Penny um, talked about those deferred deliveries as that water being set aside um, and for delivery later. So even though that is not in that forward trade limit of 190 gigalitres, it is still owed from the Goulburn to the Murray. So you, there can still be back trade against that. So um, you can see there in the darker green line, that's a year where the, um, I've, the balance is brought right back down to zero and there is no um, deferred delivery amount. So in that year, there's been no deferred delivery. So it's for instance, not as a wet year as, as this year has been. Um, so there is no deferred delivery sitting there and you're just um, available back trade is only again that 190 gigalitres. You can see by the end of the season, there's um, a lot less opportunity to back trade. And by about April, you're hitting that 20 gigalitre back trade reserve mark, which is when back trade closes. That lighter green line is a year like that's actually this year. That's the amount of deferred um, volume we have there at the moment, which means that there is essentially back trade available till the end of the season. Um, as we're drawing down that IV, that balance, but you've still got that deferred delivery sitting there. Um, so it's just a little bit of an example of how that opportunity does decrease towards the end of the season. Um, so I just very quickly touch on where to find the information about current trade opportunity. Um, so the first, all of this is on the Victorian Water Register. Um, and the first one is the um, where can I trade widget. So you can see um, up in the top left hand corner there um, that where can I trade um, icon is on the homepage of the Victorian Water Register. So it brings up this neat diagram that has those arrows, those green arrows and those red arrows. Um, the ones circled there on the right hand side you can see that there's a red arrow going forward and a green arrow going back. So that red arrow is your um, trade opportunity from the Goldman um, out into the Murray system. And the green um, arrow there is the back trade opportunity. So if you hover on those, you actually can just see the amount of trade opportunity available. Alternatively, you can actually say where you wanna trade from and two, and it will show you all the trade rules that you you need to trade against. So in that, instance, you can see that that's a trade from 1A to 7, and you can see that there's a red arrow there saying that trade is closed at that time. You can even put a volume in there to see if you can get that trade um, through all the trade rules. The next one is um, on the allocation trading page on the water register. Um, again, you can say which um, zone you're trading to, and it will show you all the available trade opportunities from, um, from all the other zones. And you can see there in red, at the time there was zero trade opportunity um, from Greater Goulburn to Seven, which means the trade rule was closed. There's also, for people who wanna get much deeper into how trade opportunity is calculated and all the bits and pieces that go into it, um, on that same page, you can see down there in the yellow box, it says click here for the data that leads to the limits above. And that will bring up um, a nifty PDF, um, which is there on the right hand side, on the left hand side, sorry, um, which has all the components of how that trade opportunity is calculated. You can see there, I think I took um, this screenshot last night. Um, it does say negative. 258 um, megalitres. The reason we can be in negative trade opportunity is we do have um, some tagged use from grandfathered tagged arrangements. So they're tagged arrangements that were put in place pre-2010 and under the basin plan, they are actually exempt from those tagging restrictions. So that does mean that they do take up some trade opportunity 
under that available trade opportunity um, under the interim trade rule. So that can actually cause that balance um, to be over 190 gigalitres and can mean that we do have some negative trade opportunities. So um, that um, trade opportunity there is reflective of, of that um, tagged use. Um, so obviously there's a lot of components there, um, a lot of which we've spoken about that go into the calculation of that trade opportunity. We also have a nifty set of FAQs, which if you are very keen, um, has a really good table about what each of these components are. Um, so I think that on the next slides, I've got where you can find that information. Um, so if you've so that um, those FAQs are available on that same allocation trading page, um, but you can also follow these um, links on this um, slide here. Um, you can also find the operating plan, a summary fact sheet about the operating plan. So that's what sets out those default delivery patterns and those variations. So it explains a bit more about those, some FAQs about those. And as I said, those FAQs about those trade rule components. Um, and the link at the bottom there is the link to where um, Goulburn Murray Water posts that information about the planned IVT delivery. So they were those um, numbers that Penny was going through. So those can be um, found at that link on Goulburn Murray Water's website there. Um, so that's it from us on the Goulburn Murray trade rule side of things. <laughs> Sorry about the, um, the technical issues there. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Alex. Um, we, we, we could hear you quite clearly, so that, that was okay. Um, we are travelling um, behind time, so I, I think the best thing to do now is just to, to hand over to Penny um, and to continue with the, um, the presentation. All right. Thanks, Rob. I can kick on. Um, so, yes, I've got a short update now on the, the Murray shortfall risk um, currently, or I'll try and make it short, conscious of time <laughs> to some extent. Um, if you click on to the next one, Alex, um, I just wanted to kick off with a couple of terms and definitions so I don't start talking about things and we're, we're going down different pathways. But firstly, um, when we're talking about shortfalls in relation to the Murray, we're talking about um, a shortfall which occurs when water that is allocated and entitled to be used cannot be delivered when and where it is needed. So we're not talking about really dry or drought conditions when there's not enough water allocated or available to meet everyone's demands. This is, these shortfall risks are more common in the years where there's actually really decent water availability and water use is quite high. Um, when we have a shortfall, what that means is there's not enough water in the river to meet everyone's demands. Um, it's usually for a short period of time. So water use in that affected reach of the river needs to be temporarily rationed. Uh, shortfalls in the Murray have been fairly rare. The last time that irrigators needed to be rationed due to a shortfall in the Murray was in 2002. Um, but knowing that, there's also a lot of changes that have been happening in the system that are making delivery more challenging. So on the next slide, I've got a, a map which I can talk you through some of those big changes that have been affecting shortfall risk. So the first one is just, just upstream of Echuca there, we have the, the Barma Choke, displayed by a big orange blob on this map, but uh, that's just to draw your attention to it. So the capacity of the Barma Choke has been reducing over the last 10, 20 years. We've seen um, a reduction in the flow rates that you can pass through that part of the river without water getting out onto the floodplain. So the capacity is reduced by about 20% from what it used to be. Up in the north where Menindi is, um, or the Darling River comes into the Murray. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, we've seen much lower inflows coming in from the Darling that we did in recent years. And that puts pressure on shortfall risks or delivery challenges because we, when Menindee's available, we can use the water in there to meet most of the downstream needs of South Australia and that, that very lower part of Victoria and New South Wales, Murray. Um, when Menindee's not available, there's more pressure on getting water through that, very sh that, that reducing constriction of the Barma Choke. 
In addition to that, what Alex has just been speaking about, we've um, introduced new trade and operating rules on the Goulburn to make sure we're not um, uh, delivering water through the Goulburn at unseasonably high flow rates that are damaging the lower Goulburn River. Um, as well as that, in the, in the lower Murray Reach, we're seeing a lot of changes in how people are using water, the timing and location of the way they're using water, both from um, environmental water users and a consumptive water use perspective. And then the final thing on top of all of this, we know that, that climate change is likely to increase the variability and intensity of events, shortfall events. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we're also watching this issue with an eye to what we, what we may see climatically in the future. Um, so in terms of what's being done to, to respond to these increasing risks, there's quite a bit of work going on with the joint River Murray governments. Um, uh, nothing new, I guess, but the river has always been actively managed to avoid shortfalls, um, with the growth in the with with growing concern about this these challenges increasing, there is more focus and commitment from all River Murray governments to be looking at this closely. Um, the first key thing we do there is we make sure everyone's monitoring demand and forecast conditions very closely and responding as we can to them. Secondly, and importantly, we make sure the system is set up during spring to support those peak summer demands. So that means transferring water from Hume down to Lake Victoria or the Victorian Mid-Murray storages and surcharging weir pools and really having everything ready to go to make sure we minimise the risk of a shortfall. Um, in addition to that, more recently, there is, um, there is work kicking off to investigate feasible options to reinstate lot, lost capacity through the Barmer Choke. Um, so this is a Commonwealth-led project, um, but is working closely with all the River Murray states to understand what is feasible, um, and that means looking at all the um, all the costs as well as benefits of any potential reinstatement options. And the third thing I've mentioned there is that the joint governments and their um, through the, the Minister Murray Darling Basin Ministerial Council have committed to clearly assigning and communicating the remaining risk of a shortfall to individual water users. So while we're doing everything possible to minimise and avoid these risks, we know that they can happen and they can't be managed to zero. So it's important that when they do happen, we have clear arrangements in place for everyone to understand. In addition to the joint government work, Victoria's been doing a couple of other things. One of them has been um, limiting new extraction share in the Lower Murray. So that's since July 2009, the Victorian Water Minister called in all applications, all works licence applications related to new or increased extraction um, and um, making sure those applications won't impact on existing entitlement holders' rights or the environment by putting more pressure on delivery. Um, the second and more recent, the second thing there and more recently is um, Victorian Parliament recently passed new legislation or changes to the Victorian Water Act uh, related to the rights to water in a shortfall. And this is about making it, it clearer for water users what their rights are and what the arrangements would be in the event of a shortfall. That le legislation also um, provides for rules to be made around capping and trading extraction share. And the idea behind that is that that will enable both, um, I guess the cap enables us to protect existing um, entitlement holders' rights and the ability to trade allows people to manage their own risks within what extraction share there is available. Um, there's, I should mention, that's a, a sort of 18 month project and there's a lot of consultation to go through before we get to a point of actually implementing any rules there. So you're not gonna suddenly see that happen tomorrow. And the third one, again, we've mentioned it quite a bit. We've introduced these new, or the interim Goulburn trade rules this year, and they're designed to ensure that the traded water doesn't increase Murray delivery risks and that it can be delivered within those ecological tolerances. Um, so in terms of shortfall risk this year, um, it's worth noting there, there are two different types of shortfalls we think about. The first one we call a system shortfall, 
which is a shortfall due to a lack of capacity in the river system. So um, this year, MDVA advised this one is very low risk, and that's because of the high availability of water in Menindee Lakes. Um, so with lots of capacity to supply downstream needs from Menindee, there's less pressure on getting water through the choke and there is plenty, we're expecting there to be plenty of spare capacity in the River Murray itself this year. The second one though is a, what we call a delivery shortfall. And this is not to do with the capacity of the system, but to do with the lack of time to get enough water to where the demand is when demand unexpectedly spikes. So this is a risk that exists every year um, and so this year it's an ongoing risk and something that will be continue to be monitored. Um, I've got a few more notes on this slide just to come up if you could, Alex, just about things to be aware of in terms of delivery shortfalls. Um, so delivery shortfalls, um, the risk is higher during a heat wave. Obviously that's when demands may unexpectedly spike, but also when flows in the river are low. Um, so it takes about three weeks for water released from Hume Dam to get its way down to Mildura. So at the time releases are made from Hume, it's based on forecast conditions and forecast demands at that time. Um, and for um, and that means that that when we're, when those decisions are made, they know that any unused water that's released, it may be able to be captured in the downstream storages like Lake Victoria. Um, when there's spare capacity in those storages. But if there's no spare capacity in those storages, releasing more water at that time, if it's not going to be used, can actually impact on water availability and future allocations. So the states are working very closely with river operators to make sure that we're balancing these delivery shortfall risks with resource efficiency for Murray entitlement holders. A um, bit of information here. These are places to go and get the latest information about where um, shortfall, what, what the current shortfall risk is. These are two MDBA documents. They've been putting out more information really every year in this space. The first one, the annual operating outlook is released in July and updated in December. So it's more of a long-term outlook. And the second one, the River Murray Weekly Report is published every Friday on MDBA's website. And that has more um, current week live information about the risk. So particularly during the shortfall risk period, um, that'll be the most up-to-date information, uh, most up-to-date place to go for your information. I should say this work, this goes report goes out every week of the year, but the information about delivery shortfalls and, and system shortfalls um, is only there during the peak risk period. Uh, currently that hasn't started just because of such high flows in the Murray. Uh, but I expect as those flows start to recede that we will see those updates coming in there. Um, I'm conscious I've gone over time. I could probably wrap it up here if you want. I had a couple more things here about where to go to get more information for water users about shortfall risks. Um, we put out some fact sheets uh, earlier this week which include information about, well, what's changing and making these delivery risks in the Murray. Um, Murray more challenging. Um, secondly, the what the shortfalls in, in the Victorian Murray mean and what impact it will have on Victorian water users. Uh, Golden Murray Water and Lower Murray Water both have lots of information about these things on their websites as well, specific for their customers. And Agricultural Victoria also has some great fact sheets about things you can do to manage with less water. Um, Sorry for rushing through a bit there, but I think that's my main things covered. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Penny, and thanks, Sarah and, and Alex. Um, we, we have gone over time, um, so I, I appreciate that people might want to leave and, and that's fine. Um, but I, I think if, if it's okay with you guys, we, we might just stick around for the next 10 minutes. Um, there are a number of questions that have, have come in um, and so it would be good to, uh, to, to answer those if, if that's okay. Um, um, people might notice that a survey has just gone up on the screen. Um, if you are able to complete that, that would be good. Thanks. I think there's only um, nine or, or ten questions on that 
on that survey. Um, so just just a, a quick summary about the gold and oil and tea trade, and this is some of the key messages that I've got, Alex and Sarah. So please correct me if I misunderstood. Um, but generally, about 130 gigalitres of net trade from the gold and intervalley account expected this year and in in future years with average conditions. This 130 gigs um, compared to historic values, it's similar to the volume traded in 2019-20, but it's it's about it's about half of the volume that was traded in 2017-18, which was 250 gigalitres. Um, and last year, last season, there was a net trade of, of minus 20 gigalitres. So in terms of total volumes traded out of the golden system, it varies quite a lot from, from year to year. Um, in terms of seasonal timing, the, the highest volumes of trade will be occurring from September to the 15th of December out of the Golden account. So I hope that's that's correct, <laughs> Sarah. And, yeah, I think probably um, just one to Alex. add again. Um, sorry, we finally figured out how to kill off Alex's <laughs> stubborn laptop before. Um, yeah, so just in terms of uh, the timing question, one thing that really underpins some of the benefits of this two-part trade rule that we're, again, it's a trial year this year, so we're not sure if it'll be the long-term version, but part of what you get out of that is more certainty about when that trade opportunity is available. So um, Alex's table that sort of compared to the old rule was showing it was a bit uncertain. It really did depend on when uh, that water was pulled out of the Goulburn. We had seen in previous years the, those deliveries of the Goulburn, out of the Goulburn happening over summer and autumn, and that led to those really sustained high flows. So if we're pulling back on that and getting a more even delivery pattern under the operating plan spread throughout the year and really focusing trade opportunity on that first part of the year so it's still water that we know we can deliver, part of the benefit of this rule is that we're running the IVT balance down the second half as 50 gig normally, Pretty much, you know, something that you can be a lot more certain of that at opening of each season, you're going to see around 50 gig of trade opportunity on 1 July. That is, um, you know, not going to take any of the heat out of the market in terms of competition, but some of what the ACCC has shown is that when you've got larger volumes of water available, bang, all at the same time, you do get more of a diverse users taking up that trade opportunity, which we think is a good thing. So more certainty for the market around when that trade opportunity is available. And then as you mentioned, Rob, the rest of it is in that whole winter spring period, which is gonna be more in response, in response to seasonal conditions, more in years where we can deliver more, less in years when we can't deliver as much because some of the high flow triggers like this year are being, are being met. So it does give a bit more certainty as to when that trade opportunity is available. Great. Um, and just in terms of the, the Murray shortfall risk, um, that risk is there for 21-22. Um, and just to monitor the Murray-Darling Basin Authority weekly report for updated information on that, that delivery risk. Um, some of the, the questions that we've, we've had come in is... Um, uh, Reportedly, the, the Golden Valley Intervalley trade has been opening weekly with five to six gigawatts being traded each week. Could you explain the mechanics of how this has been happening? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know, Alex or Penny, do you want to, given that these guys are in the day-to-day -day back end? Um, yeah, so every um, week, obviously, so those default delivery patterns are um, are what we expect to deliver when conditions average. Um, at the start of, uh, well, you know, end of the month before, basically um, the river operators sit down and look at the conditions expected for the month and they um, determine what those um, default delivery pattern is expected to be based on those expected conditions. Um, and you can see that updated on Goulburn Murray's website at the start of, of each month. Um, and then each week, essentially, they go and have a little bit of a wrap up and go, what actually happened? 
um, what actually was delivered and deferred based on those conditions. And that's what gets popped into the um, water register. And then on Wednesday at 10 a.m., um, basically those, those entries open up those, that trade opportunity in the water register. So um, even though they do kind of do a plan for the month, obviously we know that the conditions free and change. So it's of each, uh, uh, you know, in weekly kind of blocks, you go, well, what actually was delivered? Um, and then that becomes an as trade opportunity or delivered or deferred, <laughs> yeah. should say. And um, Penny, just giving you a sec to find the unmute, but I think last month was probably a really good example. So you start the month off with what your best guess is that's going to happen. Importantly, under the operating plan, we do have a default. And then as these conditions actually play out, that um, delivery is actually varied as well. So Penny, I think um, last month we actually saw an increase in deliveries from what the default volume was in response to uh, demands increasing, even though it has been wet, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the triggers can go either way. Um, since you've given me the floor, I'll add one other thing. So the, the place on GMW's website where you find this information is the same place that they have always updated GOLB and IVT deliveries. Um, and that, as Alex mentioned, they do it at the start of every month. But if conditions change mid-month, just like they used to do, they'll update that on their website there as well. So, um, yeah, if you are seeing things looking different from what you thought at the start of the month, that would be the place to, to confirm why. Thank you. Another question. Uh, the new rules are likely to limit the extent of carryover parking in the Golden system. Do you think this is correct? I think it's probably more a question of timing. Uh, so Alex did get a little bit, when we're talking about carryover parking for context, we're really talking about um, back, trade. back trade from the Murray to the Goulburn, which I think is a good reminder as well. It is a bit, it is a bit, um, is a bit uh, of a reminder that it doesn't all move in one direction every single year. And sometimes that is uh, because people are parking carryover up in Eildon, for example, which is, you know, we saw a fair bit of last year. Uh, some of this is a bit about timing. So as Alex ran through, we've got this graph that will hopefully be handy for people to have um, in your back pocket. You can see how we would expect back trade opportunity to sort of taper off in the back half of the year in response to uh, the IVT balance being drawn down. So as we have less water owed for delivery from the Goulburn to the money, money to the Murray, there is less um, opportunity for people to back trade up into the Goulburn as well. So I think if anything, it will actually still be a question more so about timing um, and that that sort of behavior will happen at different points of the year or more reliably at different parts of the year. I think, and also this year is a good example. Interestingly, in a wetter year, um, we obviously have more um, deliveries that are deferred because of those, um, those spill risks downstream, um, which does mean that there is that water sitting there that is undelivered that can still be back traded against. So as we saw in those graphs I showed, as you're teetering off that 190 gigalitres, obviously your back trade opportunity decreases. But if you do have that um, deferred um, volume sitting there, you also have the opportunity to back trade against that um, deferred volume. So at the moment, um, there is a bit more um, back trade than that 190 gigalitres. Um, you'll notice if you, if you pop onto the um, water register. So. Um, there is that kind of opportunity to trade against anything that isn't um, isn't delivered. Just in, in terms of um, carryover and carryover parking and back trading. So, if a, a Murray irrigator, for example, um, parks water on, so they have to purchase Goulburn water. Is that no? They park their water on Goulburn entitlement. Um, so uh, you're classing that as, as back trade, is that correct? Yeah, that's essentially the mechanism. That's how you get that water to be parked up in, in Eildon. So if it's your carryover, you use it however you want. If you're leasing space from somebody else, you essentially have to trade it up into where those storages are and then wait for the trade opportunity to be open again to get it back out. So it is all okay. kinds of decisions that people make in terms of spreading their risk around. Um, yep. But, you know, previously we've seen fewer spills happen out of Eildon, so that's why people choose to do that. Obviously, if it's um, your own water, though, that you've got up in Hume, if it's not spilling, then you can use it earlier in the year. And I think it's also important to note, Rob, um, that 
even if it's, you know, if I own an account in the Murray and an account in the Goulburn, I'm, yes, I'm trading to myself, but it's still a trade. It's still about that okay. order. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, another question, what factors typ typically affect the amount of water that is traded from the Goulburn IBT each year? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, what a lot of our work has been about is setting those upper limits. So not seeing a repeat of those years where we did see really high volumes of trade, but also damage to the Goulburn. What drove those really high volumes of trade and the demand for that trade in those two extreme years was that drought that was happening, worst on record in parts of the Murray-Darling Basin, meant that trade out of the Murrumbidgee was clearly unavailable. So the only place that people could turn to for trade or the place they mostly turned to for trade was to get water out of the Goulburn. So we did see that really driving demands for trade out of the Goulburn in those years as well. Conversely, you might see years, uh, it's not going to be unheard of. Obviously, there's, you know, a lot of competition for trade, but you could see years where that trade opportunity isn't actually taken up. So we might still be below the 190 limit. And that might be if it's very wet, if there aren't demands, if water's just heaps cheaper from elsewhere as well. Yeah, thanks for that. Will Goulburn IBT rules be enforced during peak demand for downstream irrigators with permanent plantings? Yeah, so that's a good question as well. It does touch a little bit on the delivery risks. I will say um, part of the Golden to Murray trade review has been a lot of work with river operators as well in the MDBA. So really looking at how we can create trade opportunity that we know we can deliver within the ecological tolerances of the river. And basically uh, implicit with that, water that we know we can make good on, don't enable trade to occur unless we can actually back that up with delivery. So that's how we're trying to prevent those risks from increasing even further in the Murray. However, those risks do exist already in the Murray, as Penny alluded to, there are shortfall risks every season. That is ongoing work with the other states and the MDBA. And what we've seen through this Golden to Murray trade review is to really uh, ask river operators to plan early around the Goulburn and noting that there are trade-offs to be made, that you can't just rely on the Goulburn over that peak summer and autumn period without consequences like the past, that did lead to environmental damage. So really what this is about is saying there are a mix of, op of different options uh, responding to emerging or actual shortfall conditions. Um, in the most recent Murray-Darling Basin Authority, uh, well, in their annual outlook earlier this year, they said, you know, they're planning around the interim rules that we've put in place this year. If conditions deteriorate greatly, we will be at the table with the other states looking at our options. But the point here is that the Goulburn isn't the go-to. Yep, yep. Thanks for that. And I'll, I'll make this the... the Sorry, I've just got another question going up. Uh, second last question. Um, what progress has been achieved in addressing the balm and choke issues? Also a good question. I might throw it a penny for that one because she's in the thick of it. Yeah. I assume this means the, the capacity reductions in the capacity of balm and choke. Um, so, yeah, that's right, yeah. So, um, there's quite a bit of work being led through the MDBA and it will be linked in with that feasibility study around options for reinstating capacity through the Barmachoke. Um, in the, the short and immediate term, there is work underway to make sure we've got a program to, to repair banks and make sure we're not, um, or at least maintaining what we've got in terms of the bank condition. Uh, there's also been a lot of um, uh, invest. Uh, yeah, a lot of geomorphologists investigating and the, uh, the build-up of sediment on the base of the Barma Choke. Um, so they have done a, a lot of testing, found there's very deep levels of sand in, sand in part of, parts of that choke. And um, the, the trend there um, is that it, it could potentially keep reducing over time. So we are investigating as a, as a collective what, what the options are to manage um, that condition of the choke into the future. Not a lot of easy answers, not expecting it to be to be a quick one, but it's a pretty important part of the river system to a lot of people. Thanks, Penny. Um, I'll make this the last question. You mentioned that timing and location of water use is changing. 
Is this in reference to horticultural plantings in the Lower Murray? And what, what impact is this having on trade? Yeah, so I think it's it's both to do with how irrigators are using water between the, the cropping and the horticulture use, um, but also to do with how environmental water holders are using their water differently. So a lot of environmental water is now being used in winter and spring that previously would have been used through that summer period. Um, however, there are still environmental demands in the Lower Murray over summer as well. Um, the, the impact that these changes are having on trade is I guess it's it's part of the whole picture. So we've got we've got um, we've got the limits on trade. There's only so much water that can be traded in, and then it's I guess the I feel like I'm waffling here. <laughs> um, yeah, how that how that actually plays out in terms of um, price of water and who is actually purchasing the water that's available on the market. I think if we think about um, Penny's glorious map that I love to look at, but if we think about that map, we are seeing um, some of those shifts occurring in demands um, really regionally and below the choke. And that's because we do have the choke trade rule. We do have trade rules um, out of, um, you know, we have inter-valley trade rules on the Murrumbidgee and also on the Goulburn. And the idea is if you have those trade rule settings right you're not enabling trade out of those rivers unless it's something that the rivers there can handle and that you know you can deliver. So then what we're left with is anyone right now who already has a farm could change their mix of what they're growing right now. That's often going to be in response to what's going to be most valuable to grow. Um, so we can see people change what their operations are on farm and we have seen those new developments as well. That's where the minister's uh, calling works licenses in has been quite helpful because we're making sure that these new developments or redevelopments are having to think about how that water will actually get delivered to them as well. So not dishing out um, delivery rights that could actually impact on people that already have existing delivery rights in the form of extraction shares, that we're not further eroding anyone's um, rights to water if a shortfall does occur. So that's been where uh, I guess the demand shift has really been occurring is below the choke, but we're still asking people to factor that into their planning ahead of time as well. Thanks again for that. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll wind it up. We are, it's nearly 25 past um, two. So we have gone a bit over time and I, I do apologize for that. But um, thanks uh, to our speakers, to Sarah and Alex and Penny for um, very informative presentations on quite a complex um, topic. Um, yeah, I, I think you've explained it quite quite well. Um, thanks also to, to Sandra uh, Beasley for um, managing all the technical issues with the webinar. And thank you to the, all the participants um, for being part of this and for participating in the webinar. I hope you have a good afternoon and um, dare I say it this earlier, a good Christmas. Thank you.